Hey, how's it going? I would like to see if I could give you a little insight into the formula E to the IX. And um, I'm actually pretty excited to look into this because um, I've always kind of been like a little bit unsettled with it because we use it all the time in electrical engineering for, I mean, for AC signals. We use it for electromagnetic waves. I use it for my laser research. Um, use it for Fourier transforms. It's just everywhere in electrical engineering. And, you know, after a while as a student, as I'm going through all this, I'm like, wait, hold on a second. What, why are we using E to the IX? I mean, I is an imaginary number. I mean, these are very real physical electrical signals in the real physical world, but we're using an imaginary number for it. And it always, I never quite got it. And that's why I'd like to just share with you a little bit of the intuition behind it to see why we actually use it and hopefully helps it just make sense a little bit. It's still going to be somewhat baffling, <laughs> but, um, hopefully this helps, um, uh, just a little bit. So first, let's just revisit um, what e to the x is. All right, e to the x, where does that even come from? What is even e, right? Let's just go back to a little bit of review, make sure we're on the same page. Just refresh a little bit, and then, then we'll, we'll get into it. So um, let's just start off with e to the x. Now, um, I'm going to go ahead and plot this out, and um, we'll see that if, um, let's just say that um, we're going to call our f of x function in red, we'll call that um, a to the x, and then we'll call in blue our um, f prime of x, look at its derivative as we plot it out. And if you take the derivative of this, that's going to be uh, natural log of a of a to the x. So um, let's first look at when a equals 2. So when um, a equals 2, in this case we find that the function f of x is going to be greater than its derivative of prime of x. And if we go ahead and plot this again, and for a equals 4, we find something a little bit different. If a equals 4, we find that our function is actually going to be less than its derivative. So if you can imagine, if on one side a equals 2, that it's that um, function is greater than its derivative. On the other side, a equals four. It's less than. There's probably something in the middle where this actually equals out, and just so it turns out that number is e. So when a equals e, then which is approximately let's say 2.7, close. Then um, then we have f of x is equal to its derivative f prime of x, which is makes for a lot of crazy um, and very useful and interesting phenomena when, when we're using that number e. And that's, what, that's just as a reminder, um, that's where it's coming from. And let's do a little bit more of a reminder just with exponents in general. Um, let's do this kind of out of the way down here. Exponents. So what is, it, what is an exponent anyway? So um, e, let's just say e to the 3. Well, you know, that's just e times e times e, pretty easy. Another way you could think of that is e to the 1 times e to the 1 times e to the 1, and you can just add up all these exponents so that's e to the 3. Pretty basic. Um, how about e to the 0 0.5? Well, that's not quite as straightforward, but um, not, to, not that hard either, because if we just think about it over here on the side, if say we had e to the 0 0.5, um, times e to the 0 0.5. We could kind of do the same thing here where we added the exponents. That's just going to be equal to um, e to the 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5, which is just going to be equal to e to the 1. So um, we could say that e is equal to e to the 0 0.5 squared. So basically that this is kind of the, the exponential um, math that, that we can use to just say e to the 0 0.5 is just the square root of e. Um, so, you know, just as a little reminder what exponents are. But if I'm using this form of exponents, if I understand what this is what exponent is, and what, what the heck is e to the i something? e to the 3i. Like, what would e to the 3i be? i is an imaginary number. is a square root of negative 1, right? So how do I, how do I multiply something by itself the, the square root of negative 1 times? I mean, it just kind of doesn't, it's hard to really 
envision what that is or what that actually means. And I actually got a little quote from you. So if you start to understand, you're not quite alone because the mathematician Benjamin Price said in about 1800, it is absolutely paradoxical. We cannot understand it and we don't know what it means, but we have proved it and therefore we know it must be the truth. So how do we prove? We can't actually prove what this, what e to the i x is. Um, but in order to do that, we're going to have to kind of veer away from this typical understanding of what exponents are and just go to the, um, the Taylor series expansion version of what e to the x is. So let's, um, let's jump to that. Taylor series expansion. So the Taylor series expansion for e to the x, which um, perhaps you're familiar with, is just going to be e to the x is equal to 1 plus x over 1 factorial plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial. And hopefully you can see this pattern developing here, and it's just going to keep going on um, infinitely. This infinite series is going to be equal to e to the x. So um, let's just throw an example up there um, before we get we throw any, anything crazy here with imaginary numbers, and let's just say e to the 1. e to the 1, nothing um, fancy about that. It's just 1 plus 1 over 1 factorial, which is 1, plus uh, 1 squared over 2 factorial, which is 2, plus 1 cubed, which is 1, over 3 factorial, which turns out to be 3 times 2 is 6, plus 1 to the 4th, which is just 1, over 4 factorial, which is 4 times 3 is 12, times 2 is 24, um, so let's, we're not going to do all these, so let's just say, make this an approximate right here. And it's going to be approximately, uh, approximately 2.709. So, simple enough. That's how you just um, apply this um, Taylor series. Now, um, let's go ahead and move this on to I. Because although we can't really envision how we're going to throw an i into this so a typical form of exponents, we can simply just throw an i into here and see, see what happens, see how it plays out. So um, maybe we'll start with something really easy. Let's just say we're moving on to um, e to the i x now. Um, so let's just say x equals 0. So for x equals 0, we have e to the i times 0. And that's going to be equal to, I'm just going to plug this in here, 1. And all these x's are 0, so it's just going to still equal 1. So that's easy. That's easy. All right, so let's move up in difficulty a little bit, away from 0, and just say x equals 1. So when x equals 1, we have e to the i times 1. And now we can just plug that, um, this i times 1 in for each of these x values. So we've got 1. So um, working through this a little bit, we've got 1 plus... Um, these are going to end up being the same numbers as up here, basically, but, in, but it turns out in this case, instead of a 1 here, I've got that i on top. So 1 plus i, and then I've got i squared over 2. So i squared, of course, i is a squared of negative 1. So if you square it, it's, it's going to be, um, if you square i, it's going to be negative 1. So we've got negative 0 0.5. And um, this is um, i cubed is just i squared times i. So it's negative 1 times i, which is negative i. So we've got minus i over 6. And i to the fourth is just going to be i squared quantity squared, so it's going to be negative one squared. So that's just going to be back to one again. So we've got plus um, one over twenty-four. And we already found those decimals up here, so that's going to be. And um, this is where uh, it might be helpful to start plotting this out. So and the way we're going to plot this out is with our complex plane because we got it. We've introduced this complex imaginary number. So complex plane, we've got two different axes here. We've got the real axis, and this is our going to be our imaginary axis up here. All right, let's go ahead and plot out our first point here. Our first point was when x is equal to 0, and we, when x equals to 0, we've got um, this value of just 1. So that's a real, that's a real number. There's no i here. So it's just one on our real plane. So let's, it's just right here, one. There's nothing on the imaginary. So this is our first point. Um, x equals zero. Um, our next point over here <coughs> was at, um, when x equals one. 
And to show this, let's go ahead and actually we can just kind of do each one of these steps here. So first we're going to go over one. So we're going to go, um, we're going to plus one to it. Then we're going to plus i to it. So up, up one in the i direction. Then we're going to subtract 0 0.5 in the real number. So back this way, 0 0.5. Then we're going to go down 0 0.167 in the i. So just a little bit down. And then we're going to go over 0 0.042 just a little bit in that real direction. So here's our point. This is our x equals zero here, and this is our x equals one point right here. All right, so let's um, let's keep this going. Um, instead of using integer numbers, let's go ahead and throw pi related number in there. And how about pi over two? If we throw an e to the i times pi over two, and we just throw pi over two, and for all these x values, um, we end up with Um, okay, so let's go ahead and work this out over in a complex plane over here. So I'm going to try not to overlap this exactly, so I'll go a little bit under it. But again, we're going over, over 1 here. And then we're going to go up 1.6. So we're going to go a little bit past this, up to here. And then we're going to go minus 1.23. So we're going to go a little bit past this axis over here. And we're going to go down 0.65, so a little bit under this one and then plus 0.25. So we end up right about here somewhere. This is our um, x equals pi over 2 point. If we calculate this out or just add these up, that's going to be 0 0.02 plus 0.92i, which is fairly close to this 0 0.10 here, but not quite. And that indicates that maybe we need to add a little bit more um, of these uh, series. Maybe we should go a little bit past x to the fourth to get a little bit more fidelity here. But um, something to note here, you can see as we're adding these up, you can see we're sort of spiraling, spiraling around and we're kind of like going in this circle and we're kind of zeroing in on the point it actually is. And the more, the more Taylor series values that we have, the more we can kind of spiral and zero in. And the reason we're kind of spiraling like this is because each time we're adding a component here, we're multiplying by i because you've got i over the i squared i the cube. You keep multiplying by i, and every time you multiply by i, it's like you're it's like you're taking a left turn. It's like you're doing a ninety degree um, rotation every time, and so you keep you keep doing the spiral as you keep multiplying by i, and adding smaller values. All right, last um, point here. Let's go with e to the i pi and. You can tell in this case we were maybe needed some more terms, so we're going to go ahead and go up to 10 terms on this. And don't worry, I'll run them out really quick over here. So e to the i pi. Okay, and by the time I get out to the 10th or 11th term, you see these are starting to get smaller, which indicates that we're kind of we're zeroing in, you know, pretty tight on where this is. So let me go ahead and draw out this path. As we, as we just keep going um, through all of these additions and subtractions here. Okay, so you see we had to take a couple more spirals, but but what we um, we ended up getting really close here. It turns out if I um, if I uh, write that point here, this is the x equals pi point. We've got um, e to the i pi is equal to, so it's basically the point negative one zero and it will get there if we keep, if we kept spiraling and get exactly to that point. But you can see how adding more values is getting, giving us a bit more accurate number. And um, another thing you might notice here just as a, just sort of an intuition what e to the i pi is doing is that if you think e to the x like up here, we're just going to keep adding terms and it's just going to keep getting bigger, right? It's exponential, right? It's going to keep, keep expanding really fast. But why is it that this e to the i x does not keep expanding like that? Well, you can see it on here because we're adding and subtracting terms. Now, we're not just adding them like we are up here. Now we're going to, you know, adding i terms and we're going to subtract i terms. We're going to add these x terms or that we're going to add the real values and then subtract them. We kind of keep going back and forth and we're spiraling instead of just 
uh, going, you know, bigger, bigger, bigger. We're just kind of getting um, tighter and tighter in and in, in, um, spiraling in. So that's why e to the e to the i x doesn't actually expand exponentially like e to the x does. It spirals, it spirals in instead. And it turns out it spirals in to very specific um, points that just happen to be on what you may imagine here. This is going to be our unit circle. So we start here at x equals zero, and you go up to this x equals one. When x equals pi over two, you actually cross that um, zero one point up here, and you come down. And you'll actually keep cycling. Oh, that's a, I, did, I wrote this really bad, didn't I? But imagine that's an actual circle. And that's what um, e to the i x does. It just keeps cycling around here. So you can imagine at this, um, when I went to e to the i pi, what, I, what happened was I started at you know, x equals 0 here, and I went full pi radians all the way over here. It's like the distance I traveled would have been pi, and I went from the point um, one zero to the point negative one zero via a distance of pi, which is sort of that half of that circumference around that unit circle. So a um, couple things to take home here. Let's write them out. <clears throat> All right, so uh, e to the i x follows unit circle in complex plane. Where x is distance traveled around unit circle. So that's just kind of a basic idea of what, of what e to the x represents here. And something also very fundamental that, um, that you may kind of notice here is this if, if, it, if e to the ix is following this unit circle, then it can also be explained by um, cosines and sines. So that's where we get Euler's formula, which is very important. So Euler's formula states that e to the i x is equal to cosine of x plus i sine of x, where this cosine of x is sort of the real component, and this i sine of x is our imaginary component. Very important, so let me go ahead and box that in. All right, so as you can imagine, this um, e to the ix can be a lot easier to use than, than using these trig terms, cosine of x and i, co and I sine of x. That's why it can be extremely helpful and it's used all throughout electrical engineering. Um, like I said, with electromagnetic waves, with AC signals, I'll um, use it with lasers again. Um, it's used in the Fourier transform. It's used everywhere. And even though there's this i in there, that doesn't mean it doesn't actually um, relate to the real world. It, re it really does. And if this does help uh, make sense of what e to the ix is a little bit, um, I promise you that's going to go a long way to understanding the math behind the physics, which explains um, a lot of the electrical engineering and all these types of applications. And if you understand it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help you immensely. So again, I hope this was a little bit helpful. And until next time, take care.